Hello, and uh, this week we come to the fifth Sunday of the year. And um, our readings this time, the first reading comes from the book of Job, chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, and then verses 6 and 7. The second reading uh, from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, which we have been listening to over the last few weeks, this time chapter 9, verses 16 through 19, and then we skip and do verses 22 and 23. <clears throat> and finally, the uh, Gospel of Mark, we're still in chapter 1, uh, this time verses 29 through 39. Now, um, as we're looking at uh, this story of uh, Jesus, as recorded, you remember, by the tradition according to Mark, he tends to present uh, his opening uh, series of narrations with regard to who Jesus is by uh, kind of presenting it as um, a week. Somehow that idea of an opening week um, is a pattern not only here used by Mark, but also the Gospel writer of John tended to use that. Now, uh, this time the Gospel picks up where it left off last time. Last time you remember that Jesus had come to Copernicum, that he had brought with him, uh, we believe, the four disciples or apostles that he had chosen, uh, that he goes into the synagogue uh, on the Sabbath, and that he begins to teach, and the, uh, a notice is given that he teaches with authority. Remember that that had been uh, kind of something that caught and the word used, of course, by the gospel writer, amazement caused the, caught the attendance of people. Now, the story continues that having left the synagogue, they go to the house of Peter and Andrew. Now, we're not sure how far away from the synagogue this house was, but keep in mind that Copernicum, although it was an important uh, trade city, as we have noticed on uh, other occasions, so still wasn't quite that large. So perhaps a few houses or a few minutes down. So we come to the story here where Jesus enters the house of, of Peter um, and uh, cures his, uh, Peter's mother-in-law. All right, now, just a word uh, as we're looking, as we do at these uh, traditions, and I often mention the importance of having kind of an understanding, as it were, of the background, of the cultural times. So some would ask, uh, in this curing of Peter's and mother-in-law, uh, did it really happen? Did Jesus really do it? Well, those are perhaps... Uh, the wrong questions, but nevertheless, sometimes um, they, are, um, <clears throat> they are asked. When contemporary medical anthropologists offer some interesting insights into the whole idea of a sickness, they distinguish, uh, as, you, as you remember, between a disease which is biomedical misfunction that is, it affects a certain part of the organism, or an illness which uh, disvalues human condition uh, <clears throat> for a while, ruptures the, uh, the way in which life is living as long as the illness uh, takes place. Now, here's the point that I'm trying to make without being too confusing here is, curing is aimed at a disease. Uh, and that is a rare occasion, occursion. Healing is aimed at an illness, which occurs infallibly all the time for most people. So, see, there's a difference here now, and that's the point we're making between an illness and a disease. Um, everyone works to get true meaning, if you want, out of life. Uh, no matter what that prediction is. So here's the question. 
When Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law, is it an illness, therefore something which in effect would perhaps be passing, or is it um, a disease? Now that is something that would be much more permanent. And I think we get that distinction, but perhaps uh, the scriptures do not make that distinction as, uh, as we might. All right, now we come to uh, this particular story. Jesus apparently is bringing with him, we believe, the other four who had been with him in the uh, uh, synagogue. And um, they inform him that Peter's mother-in-law is ill. Okay, now what is not mentioned here in this story is Peter's wife. We, we really, um, some would say that she, Peter was a widow, but that doesn't bear out because later on in one of the letters of Paul, he says that <clears throat> the apostles took their wives with them. <coughs> Excuse me, so that would um, indicate that she was still, uh, still alive at, at, at this time. Now, again, how does this mother-in-law uh, affect? You will remember, I think we've mentioned this before, that the ideal marriage partner in the first century world was that, mar that one married the first cousin, specifically the young man's father's brother's daughter. Get that now, so how this uh, kind of re these were certainly we would call arranged marriages, and that um, therefore when the woman married, she would, we've noticed this on other occasions, move into the household of the father of her husband. Now, Peter's mother-in-law, therefore, would be the wife of his father's brother. She should be living in her husband's house, that she is in Peter's house suggests maybe that she had no living family and um, that the members of this household are to take care of her. All right, so all of this is kind of cultural uh, background here. What he happens is a healing narrative and there's a certain pattern that is uh, used uh, often when writers speak of this kind of thing so here's the classical healing uh, narrative. It has uh, a few parts. First of all, you get a description of the illness. This is followed by a request for healing. This is followed by the healing itself. This uh, then uh, is some acclamation of the, uh, of the cure. Some references, may, oh, she is cured. And then there needs to be a demonstration of the cure. So that's the pattern. Notice it has really five aspects to it. How does this work now with the situation of Peter's mother-in-law? First is the description of the illness. She has a fever. So again, notice this would be falling into the category of an illness, not of a disease. Secondly, there is a request for healing. Someone says to Jesus uh, that her mother-in-law is ill. Next point is there is a touching moment. So coming forward to the woman, Jesus takes her by the hand and raises her up. We'll come back to this raising up image because it is one that is regularly used in uh, Mark's tradition, and seems to be a reference to the resurrection, to be raised up, to be lifted up. So is this already very early on in Mark's story, a hint of the resurrection power of God given to, uh, to Jesus. Then there is accomplishment of the cure. Remember that's the fourth point. And the gospel says, and the fever left her. And finally, there is a demonstration of the cure, and that is she gets up and waits on them. So this is what some have observed is a traditional pattern that 
Mark uses here in describing uh, this event. All right. Now, there has been some discussion about touching. Um, in some interpretations here, uh, touching, by the way, of someone who has even an illness um, could render one, uh, in this case, ritually impure. Uh, in other words, there was a, uh, oh, somehow some transferring of the illness to the one who touched. Now, <clears throat> that is one interpretation that is sometimes given here, is that by touching the woman, Jesus rendered himself impure. Not, and it's important perhaps to notice here, that the illness was contagious, and therefore it passed to the one who touched. That would be another interpretation, but which really doesn't seem to be applicable in this situation. But in fact, when Jesus, and it's interesting here, touches the woman, that the fever flees from the woman. Now, remember earlier on in the story last time that uh, Jesus uh, had spoken to the evil spirits, and when Jesus had called them, they had fleed out of the man who um, had the evil spirit. So that imagery of leaving is that what is the wrong goes not to the person who is touching here or curing, but somewhere else and out there and away. So um, that's what uh, Jesus uh, is pictured as doing here. Um, now, whether or not he was rendered ritually impure, uh, and as I say, we have some interpretation because that would mean that he would have to go and can, you know, tell it to the uh, leadership up in Jerusalem, to the priests, and get all the kind of rituals of being ready to be restored back to the community or not. That does not seem to be um, the prevalent in, Math, in Mark's story here, but there is that uh, concern. So one notices, <clears throat> and, and I've really kind of assumed that you read the whole little episode here. Um, now there's been kind of the critics who say, well, when the woman uh, who is cured, by the way, she is not named. She is simply mentioned as Peter's brother, and a mother-in-law rather, and um, waits on them. Now, there are a couple of ways in which this could be interpreted. One goes to the fact that in the, again, first century world, and we're always got to be a little careful that we don't judge their times by our times. If you do something for someone, if you, and we've mentioned this on other occasions, if you do a kindness to another, whatever it is, there's an expectation of repayment. So, as we might uh, use the adage, there's no free lunches sometimes. Well, if the cure of the mother-in-law is done by Jesus, then there's some expectation of a return. And that would be why she waits on not only Jesus, but one assumes uh, the other partners who are with him and maybe the other members who are in the household. So that would be one way to see how this whole kind of works. Jesus does something good for her, she does something uh, good for him, thus the balance. And remember we said in an, a limited way of thinking, notice we've mentioned this on a few occasions, the balance is kept. Help, help, thank you, all right. Another way, however, to interpret what uh, Peter's mother-in-law does is that she fulfills a quality that we have mentioned very often, namely hospitality. So if indeed, even though this is Peter's uh, house, uh, nevertheless, Jesus is the guest, and so she immediately, when she is able, offers, again, hospitality. That would be service, would be food, would be uh, a, a kind of accompaniment of something as she, he enters the household. So that would be a little different interpretation as to why she does what uh, 
what, what she does. And we have noticed on many occasions the importance of hospitality as a um, quality of, well, that all Mediterranean cultures held as very important. Now, uh, there are different kinds of healers going to the fact that this, again, is a story of Jesus healing. And certainly in Mark's story, Jesus is often pictured as healing. Um, he might be pictured here, though, not as a medical doctor, but is more portrayed as what analysts call a folk healer. That is, the spirit who fills a prophet or a teacher with a certain power, a certain gift, and he uses it for the benefit and the sake of others. Um, one will notice I, uh, frequently in Jesus' healings, and we will hear more of those, certainly uh, as we move through looking at Mark's story, that he restores a sick person <clears throat> to their proper status. Uh, and that's one of the things that folk healers do. Later on, we'll see, for example, he will heal a, a leper, and that restores the ability of the leper to return to the community to become um, a member again with good standing. Or he raises someone who is dead. Well, restored to life, again, makes them a member of their family and, of course, to the larger community. So um, it is interesting in this gospel that Jesus frequently is pictured as touching or someone touching him or connections with both of them. We will see other stories as we go along. I just mentioned these as some characteristics which are part of uh, Mark's tradition. Uh, <clears throat> in kind of finishing this little episode, notice that when people, when uh, Jesus comes to Peter's house, it now becomes a public place. For what happens is, <clears throat> and this is where the gospel continues this time, people uh, gather at the door house of, or door at the entrance if you want, to Peter's house, and that cures begin to uh, take place. Now, this happens at the conclusion of the Sabbath. You remember that the, uh, and that would be, uh, well, uh, the Sabbath ends at nightfall, or not darkness necessarily, but when, you know, the end of the day, technically the sun goes down and the light still remains, all of that kind of stuff. However, the, the uh, citizens of Copernicum respect the Sabbath. Remember, no work was to be done by the Sabbath, although Jesus had already done that, but nevertheless, uh, here they respect him, and many are uh, cured. Jesus is pictured, as I mentioned, as uh, bringing healing, um, and that he casts out demons. We've mentioned that last time, how important it is to recognize uh, that, that reality that really people believed and was part of their life culture. Now, the uh, little passage we're looking at this time concludes uh, that early in the morning, that would be uh, the next day, keep in mind, by the way, that that would be Sunday, uh, when we look at Sabbath, uh, remember that was uh, uh, the seventh day of the week, which would have been Saturday. Jesus um, goes away by himself to a deserted place to pray. So uh, it's interesting that Mark sees Jesus as needing, well, what we need sometimes is a little space for ourselves to get into a good relationships. However, uh, it's a picture that Peter and others say, come up to him and say, look, everyone is looking for you. And at this point, Jesus says, well, all right, we must move on now to other places because that is the mission to which I have been uh, called. <clears throat> so I like that little phrase there where Peter says to Jesus, everyone is looking for you. 
What were they looking for? After all, if many healings had already taken place, were they hoping for more? Did they want to just keep Jesus there because, well, his reputation perhaps as a healer? You want to say this, but keep in mind when certain people visit certain occasions that it draws an audience, that maybe if Jesus stayed in Copernicum, people would come there that would help not only because he was this kind of folk healer, but also you have to smile a little bit, and I add to this on my own, but um, maybe help the economy, help the whole uh, kind of fame of Copernicum increase. So that might have been a possibility why they wanted to keep Jesus or make sure that he stayed there. We do know that it was his headquarters, but, not, but that he did travel around. So all of that is um, <clears throat> to say that it, uh, this little section that we're listening to this time um, is uh, what we would call a summary statement, that this is what Jesus said, I have come to do to announce the coming of the kingdom of God. So that's uh, the gospel story this time. And as I mentioned, uh, in raising uh, Peter's mother-in-law, the fact of lifting up is an idea that we will see connected in this gospel with the idea of God raising up Jesus or with the resurrection. I mention this because later in the year when we come to uh, Mark's story of the, uh, of, of, uh, the resurrection, he has a very different approach than that taken by uh, the other writers. Now the first reading comes from the book of Job. <laughs> uh, again, the section that is chosen, chapter seven, offers what we would call, or what is called, Job's complaint about his predicament. Uh, it's a situation, he says, <clears throat> in which he receives little useful help or <clears throat> advice from his friends. Now, uh, again, quickly reviewing the story of uh, Job. Everyone, of course, is familiar with uh, parts of Job's story, but um, and, and I may have mentioned this on other occasions, but since we have a couple minutes here just to kind of reflect on this, uh, the, the book of Job is composed both of a prose section and a poetic section. The prose section are the first two chapters of the book and the last chapter of, of the book. In between, which is a long, long section, is a poetic section. Now. Um, what that indicates is that there may have been, the real author of the work is the one who is responsible for what we call the poetic section. The uh, prose section simply tells the story of a very well-to-do, very honest, very um, loyal uh, man named Job. In fact, the story opens, as you remember, that one day, um, God is pictured as being with the denizens of heaven. So again, that's the kind of viewpoint of the world. And in, uh, in comes a figure known as Satan, who um, has been checking out things for God down in the world. And God then says to uh, Satan, and here, by the way, I mentioned Satan, not as the devil, but as uh, the uh, kind of... Uh, well, the organizer, the reporter for the Lord, God says, uh, did you see my so, uh, servant Job, how great and faithful and loyal he is? Now, it's at this point, then there's a kind of wisdom that this uh, figure Satan has is, well, yeah, everything is going well for him. He has lots of money, he has a well to uh, do family. He has a home, he has a loyal wife. What more would you want? It's a perfect world. Well, says God to Job, or to uh, Satan, you can do to Job whatever you want. And uh, I'm sure that he will stay loyal. So it's interesting that it is God who is pictured as setting up a test with regard to, uh, to Job. Well, that's what happens. Now, I won't go through all of that, but if you read in chapter uh, one, what happens is um, his flock gets dis diminished, dies of a plague, gets stolen, all his goods are 
uh, taken away from him, and even pictures that his family are gathered for an occasion. The house roof falls in on and kills them all, and this report comes uh, to Job as he's sitting there, and Job says these famous words, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right. <laughs> Isn't that the patience of Job, the phrase, phrase that your grandmother always told you of was the situation? What begins, and then chapter 2 simply reiterates uh, this same idea I, we, uh, um, that Job remains loyal to the very <clears throat> situation, whereas chapter 2 ends, Job is pictured, pictured as sitting on a pile of dung heap, I let it to your imagination, English words for that, and um, it's even kind of odiferous, and his wife stands there and says, Job, you did something wrong, you're getting punished for it. All right, now, that's the kind of prose section. The poetry section pictures Job as saying, in effect, I am innocent, why am I suffering all of these things? And what happens is, he is visited by three friends who come to try to help him. What? Come to realize that he has done something wrong, that he is being punished for a deed that he ha deserves. See, it's a, a way of thinking that we would call cause and effect. You did something wrong, the effect is you get some punishment. Many. Christians still think that way, but this book challenges that. And now you get, and this is where this little section comes, um, the three uh, friends uh, each give three different talks encouraging Job to look at his life and what he has done wrong so that they will feel, and then maybe Job will feel, justified in uh, what has gone wrong for him. Now, in the section that we hear now, Job is talking to one of his friends, to the third uh, uh, guy, and um, responding to him, he complains. Now, Job, and this is interesting. Job complains. This isn't fair. This isn't right. And he mentions that there were three common frustrating experiences in the ancient world. One was to be forced into military service, two was to work as a day laborer, and three to simply be uh, engaged in slavery. So those are all kind of backgrounds. Each of them are interested here. Um, certainly the idea of the worker of a day laborer, um, usually a man who had lost his family property, um, uh, therefore, he had to have a job to earn food, to pay for the meal for his family for that night. That's why payment was always made immediately at sundown um, on those occasions. Uh, simple slavery meant that you did heavy labor very often, sometimes during the hottest uh, time of the day. Now, Job is complaining about all of these kind of situations that are occurring in his life. So listen to those as you hear this little section uh, read this uh, weekend. And Job's conclusion is, I shall never see happiness again. Job's uh, response to El Pizar, that's the third guy here that we mentioned, um, He's, they're troublesome con, uh, consolers. They're really not um, helping too much. Job's life, uh, he says, is like the wind. There is nowhere that Job can turn. Life seems to be armed against him. There is neither defense nor escape. So isn't that interesting? Uh, in fact, this whole little section pictures Job as complaining. Well, maybe there's an important uh, kind of remember, reminder here that complaining is something that is part of life. And so um, uh, this Job section and the whole 
larger section of the book of Job, uh, finds Job kind of saying to God again and again, why am I suffering for something when I have done nothing to deserve it? Well, don't you sometimes feel that way? Finally, in his little section, Paul uh, tells his, us and tells others that he is serving the needs of others free of charge. Now there's a whole discussion there we would go into perhaps some other time when we look a little bit at Corinthians, but notice Paul is always saying, I do everything for you. Don't you just love him? Don't you just love people who say that? Have a good week. See you again next time.